it's a good hunting area my uncle is born in because it is uh, near four glaciers and there's a lot of uh, ice and the, and the ice is uh, cracking all the time uh, so they don't always hear you are you are near the seal so you can get uh, really close to them I remember uh, the first time I was out uh, in a kayak uh, hunting seals there was a, a lot of seals uh, near a big glacier and uh, a lot of seals were popping up uh, around me and I couldn't decide uh, which, uh, which seal to, to hunt I, I kayaked uh, all day and everything uh, uh, my uncle told me I, I forgot so I was just paddling around uh, and the closest I got to, to, the, to the seals were about 30 meters maybe it is a difficult uh, thing to, to hunt because they are very sensitive seals even if you don't think you make any noise on the water, they can hear you, yeah. or they can feel you, and he knows you are there. So it's it's up to, to the seal if it wants to become a dead one or not. The sunny, the sunny pula, slit tomba, silly tongue in the Sunni Tavam, so many with a massa, a pair of shoes to Tam, Miran in Yamma. Eh, what's in now? Chicken am a Laran kit, Miran in notes to his to his top. Chipping in our book. Chipping in the top. Twenty five years ago, when Kanat got to feel started. You didn't see many kayakers. The ideas started in uh, AD 84, and it was uh, the Greenland Home Rule government who started that just to preserve uh, the old heritage uh, of kayaks. ま、ちなしたいのってお前のその、僕は感じてるのに、ちにでもチャージも大工と<音声><音声><音声><音声> Whoa, <laughs> Kanukiya
Hi, uh, so I'm joining you asynchronously, and I want to start out by saying that that's a word that I hate, uh, but it's something that, I, that does pertain to the topic today, which is phenomenology. Um, and I'll tell you what I think the link is in, in a little bit here. Uh, my name is Matthew Walls. I'm a faculty member in anthropology and archaeology, and if this was a normal year, I'd have probably had a chance to meet most of you by this point in the semester. Um, but I work in the Arctic. I'm interested in uh, human environment relationships and, and particularly long-term ones. So um, I'm primarily an archaeologist and um, the big question that I'm interested in is, is the long-term development of, of uh, mind and earth systems and uh, the sort of emerging codependence that, that, that we see in the Anthropocene. Now um, I'm going to talk a little bit today about um, some of my doctoral work which focused on environmental perception. Um, I did some uh, what we call ethnoarchaeological work uh, which involved um, uh, working with uh, kayakers in Greenland who practice traditional kayaking as a way of engaging heritage. And I'm going to give you some, some um, material, my, my goal is to kind of give you some material for, for the discussion um, that you can bounce some of the ideas from the readings off of. Um, and I think that I've, I've been invited in part because um, it, it, these, this kind of field of literature and, and phenomenology and, and some of the perspectives that developed out of it are something that, that certainly influenced my work a fair bit. Um, and so um, I can't join you for the discussion, so I'm going to try and focus mostly on, on giving you kind of an example to, to, to think about. Um, and that's the, the relationship between kayaks and how Inuit communities uh, perceive and, and act creatively uh, with uh, the world around them. Um, so the other thing I'm going to talk about very briefly at the end is, is what it means for, for practices in, in anthropology to uh, research practices anyways. So um, in, in my project, I used uh, film uh, a lot as a part of uh, doing research. Um, and there were some unique opportunities, I think, for uh, collaboration with the community that, that also pertain to this topic of, of phenomenology too and how we think about knowledge and how uh, researchers and communities can, can work together to, to generate outcomes of research projects that, that do exemplify um, uh, forms of knowledge that we might call relational. So just as a, a quick background, um, kayaks are a really important technology for, for a variety of different, for most circumpolar Inuit groups. Um, they're uh, made out of um, uh, driftwood frames and, and then covered in uh, skin, usually seal skin or walrus skin. Um, and they, they play a very important part of uh, Inuit origins and development. So they feature very prominently in Inuit or, or oral history and um, are tied to kind of oral history accounts of migration and uh, movement uh, through, through different areas of the Arctic. Um, across the Arctic, uh, all those different circumpolar groups uh, that are um, uh, stretched from Siberia to Greenland uh, used varieties of uh, kayaks in, in different ways. Um, uh, for each of these communities, they're used in very different circumstances for hunting different animals, and they uh, all kind of feature very prominently in social life, but sometimes in very different ways. Um, in Greenland specifically, kayaks were especially uh, important in terms of traditional subsistence. Um, so it's an area where there isn't a development of a land fast um, sea ice during the winter, so there's year-round um, open water conditions. And communities in Greenland really depended on kayak hunters um, for, for all parts of uh, subsistence. So there's this sort of daily um, dependence on, on kayakers going out and, and being able to hunt in all kinds of weather. And so kayaking is very much at the center of social life in, in, um, uh, in Greenlandic communities, um, both in, in the past and in the present as well. Um, it, it's a very important part of childhood and, and different kind of life processes as to how one uh, becomes more and more connected in, in the community through time. And there's a very kind of interesting relationship between kayaks and personhood um, uh, within communities. Um, you can kind of get a sense of what Greenlandic kayaks look like here. Uh, they're carefully tailored to an individual's body. Um, they're, they're modified and changed through time as they grow and develop their skill. And they're designed to work with an array of different uh, tools and hunting equipment. So there's different types of harpoons and um, darts that you can see arranged on the deck here. And, and basically what, what kayak hunters train for um, is, is the ability to, to take advantage of all kinds of different opportunities um, that, that they're presented with in, in sort of daily hunting um, uh, tasks. Um, so the, the organization of, of um, uh, uh, kayaking within Greenlandic communities is, is something 
I might even kind of compare it to, to say a martial art where, where it's heavily structured in terms of uh, different phases of development and practice and, and mastery. Um, there are um, carefully developed um, relationships between learners and, um, and, and teachers that are, and that these kinds of relationships are at the center of, of social life as well. Um, it takes many years of careful training and, and development to, to become a skilled Greenlandic kayaker. Um, and kayaking had, had a central role in, in traditional subsistence, um, uh, but even through most of the colonial period as, as new technologies uh, were, were introduced and there were kind of differing economic opportunities developing within uh, Greenland in, in these periods, uh, kayaking persisted through much of the colonial period and even into the 1960s. Um, uh, there were places um, in Greenland where um, families still depended on kayaking for, for daily livelihood. Um, it wasn't until um, uh, the, the 1960s that it, it really began to die out. Um, and this became kind of, the, or rather I should say, die, die out as a primary subsistence uh, uh, practice. Um, uh, in the 1980s, uh, there, there sort of began a, an organized effort to preserve the skills of kayaking. So there were still kind of different elders and community members who had grown up with uh, the skill at that point in time. Um, and there was an uh, increasing concern that, that it could disappear um, entirely without some intervention. And so in the 1980s, there was an organization called Kanak Katufiat that um, uh, developed. And their goal was to basically create a new place for uh, many of the skills of, of kayaking in uh, contemporary Greenland. So uh, they did a lot of work in developing a, a sort of sport around it. Uh, they have a national competition and they have a series of clubhouses in uh, different communities that um, are places where one can go to learn the skills and uh, get some experience um, uh, working with community members. Now the interest in, in kayaking specifically among other types of traditional practices um, wasn't just for posterity or, or kind of focused on, on nostalgia around the past. Um, uh, specifically, it was very closely linked with uh, movements in, in the 1970s and 80s towards self-governance in Greenland and, and autonomy from Greenland. Um, and through time, uh, kayaking has sort of been taken up at the center of um, activism around um, uh, building kind of um, uh, Greenlandic-focused uh, um, biodiversity management practices that, that emphasize long-term frameworks uh, of, of stewardship in, in how um, some of the changes taking place in, in the present are, are managed through things like regulations. So driving this whole emphasis on um, uh, engaging kayaking as, as a heritage, uh, heritage practice is, is an underlying um, kind of idea within uh, the, the formation of Kanak Katufiat and, and this um, um, you know, kind of emphasis on preserving the skill. Um, beneath this is the idea that there's, there's forms of Inuit knowledge that, that are tied to the physicality of, of kayaking. So there's, there's forms of awareness and uh, sensory skill that um, you can't simply pass, or, or uh, but you can't simply pass between generations, or um, uh, represent through things like like text. And so, um, for the community driving this forward, this this notion that there is um, uh, intimate knowledge in, in the physicality of practice is is the reason why they're trying to adapt it and um, find a place for for the skills um, and experiences tied to the technology in in the present. So there's. Um, a fair bit of discussion about the relationship between kayaks and, and generations. And um, uh, basically the, the idea is that, that the, the skill itself acts as a, a very important part of in, intergenerational experience. So um, it, it's a part of how the community uh, carries forward experiences uh, and ways of understanding the environment and, and applying those in, in the present. Um, and that's because the practice of, of kayaking cultivates uh, certain forms of sensory awareness and, and capacities for uh, creative responsiveness in relationship to the environment, um, which are very important in, in the present context um, where there's um, not just rapid climate change taking place, but all kinds of new political pressures that, that uh, come from the international attention that's directed at the, the Arctic in the present. So in, in my doctoral field work, um, I, I basically did about three, uh, well, I did three seasons of field work um, uh, working with, with different kayakers, and then I returned to the community during my postdoctoral work to sort of develop some of the, the outputs of um, uh, some of the work that we'd done together. Uh, the work involved participant observation, um, uh, as well as interviews with uh, kayak hunters and elders and other community members in, involved in, in the practice. 
And um, we used film a lot. Um, film actually kind of emerged as, as a part of a community recommendation, as, as one way that we could um, uh, sort of develop outcomes of, of the research that, that would be kind of meaningful and um, uh, usable within uh, the community, too. And much of what I focused on was um, uh, to do with the learning of, of how, uh, or the process of how kayakers become skilled hunters. Um, uh, so uh, Ingold used the, the term enskillment um, as opposed to enculturation. So um, in enculturation, um, you'd be sort of internalizing norms and uh, rules and um, uh, sort of schemas for action. Um, and in skillment, it's, it's more sort of focused on uh, developmental processes through which you kind of um, build uh, certain types of, of awareness. And kayaking is a really good example of, of, of the difference between enskillment and enculturation. Um, it's something that is, you know, becoming a skilled hunter is a lifelong process. Um, it takes, um, you know, uh, many years of careful training and practice to reach that point where you're, you're able to um, act as a, as a skilled hunter. Um, and the process actually starts very early in childhood. Uh, so uh, there's games where uh, uh, toddlers sit on, on their parent's lap and um, their uh, parent will sing them a song. And when they reach a certain word, they have to uh, pretend to throw a harpoon. Um, there's all kinds of other types of childhood games uh, where that, which are kind of related to kayak hunting and learning to throw harpoons and keep balance, um, things like that. And I'll, I'll show you some examples in a moment here, which are, are called the rope exercises. Um, one of the first stages um, of, of kind of formally apprenticing to become a kayak hunter is actually the construction and making of a kayak. So um, very early in, in that process, um, uh, children are involved in or kind of beginners are involved in uh, making their first kayak and learning about all the different structural dependencies in the kayak frame and um, how they're designed and the types of scenarios that uh, they're related to in terms of how, how the kayak is used. So, so the, the making of a kayak isn't just to have a kayak that you can then take out into uh, the environment and do hunting activities. It's also a didactic uh, experience, so something that, that uh, through which you're uh, learning um, quite a bit about the environment and uh, some of the scenarios in which uh, hunters encounter their world. Uh, once uh, a beginner has their kayak, uh, they uh, can begin learning some of the basic techniques. Um, there's lots of simulative exercises where you, you learn to hit targets with harpoons or um, uh, those sorts of exercises that can take place within the safety of the harbor. Um, and then as you sort of build some familiarity with those, uh, you're able to start learning some of the more advanced techniques, uh, things like rolling, um, uh, throwing, uh, uh, using the different um, uh, weapons and um, uh, the technical skills through which they're deployed. Um, and as you gain some familiarity with those, then you're able to kind of start a process of, of apprenticeship where you're, you're traveling out into the open environment with uh, hunters. And at that point, you start to develop experience about um, uh, things like navigation and, and weather and, and how to um, uh, anticipate some of the, the dangerous scenarios that, that you run into um, uh, in, in, in Arctic waters. Things like um, you know, fast moving icebergs that are picked up by the wind. Um, uh, you learn to interpret uh, changes in, in the ice flow and uh, behavior of different animals and what those mean in terms of um, uh, what's happening. Um, and then, of course, as you start building experience with those things and are able to travel out with the hunters, you start um, encountering animals, too, and learning about nuances of their behavior and um, uh, the circumstances um, in which uh, you, can, you can hunt them and how to kind of approach them and um, get into their, their sensory awareness without uh, scaring them off. Uh, you also learn a lot about stewardship practices. So there's lots of decisions that um, hunters make when they're, they're out in, in the fjords uh, where they, they um, uh, choose whether uh, sort of balance some of those hunting decisions against the uh, understandings of uh, uh, population health for those, those animals too. Uh, so we see here um, in the figure on the right, um, there's uh, Pena Torsoak, which is a, a great hunter. So this is somebody who has kind of a lifetime of experience behind them. Uh, they're in a moment of skilled practice where they're, they're uh, launching a harpoon to, to uh, hit a seal. And all these different threads represent those different uh, developmental paths through which they've kind of ex assembled that, that experience. Um, 
and and each of these are, are very important um, features of, of how uh, how those individuals encounter the world around them. Um, they they structure the uh, scenarios through which they um, encounter animals. Uh, their um, uh, experience of, of weather. They um, influence the scenarios even through which they depend on on other hunters. And so behind each of these, there's there's all kinds of different subsets of, of developed ability that are, are involved in, in assembling those skills. There's um, uh, the, the technical abilities in, in how the, the, the kayak is designed to be used along with its, its hunting equipment. Uh, there's an awful lot of fitness and conditioning that, that goes into becoming a skilled hunter. You have to uh, develop all kinds of uh, types of um, endurance and uh, flexibility and um, uh, strength. Um, you also have to have some mental conditioning too, which is, is the, the ability to deal with, with cold um, or, or uncomfortable conditions. Um, it can involve waiting uh, hours in um, uh, you know, kind of inclement conditions for the right moment to um, uh, to, to approach animals when you're, when you're stalking them, for example. Um, all kinds of environmental uh, knowledge being deployed in, in every moment of, of, of kayaking as well. Um, kayakers have to be aware of, of how the world around them is changing and um, uh, what sort of cues can, can let them know uh, uh, what, what's taking place around them and, and sort of how to balance decisions um, within those, those fields of changes. And of course, there's a huge social dimension too. There's a lot of team-based hunting skills. Um, you have to be able to um, uh, intuitively and silently be able to communicate with other hunters and coordinate action with them. You have to uh, understand what the consequences of things that you're doing will mean for, for the rest of the community. Uh, and of course, you have to be quite familiar with the uh, different rescue techniques as well. Uh, so as some material for discussion and, and thinking through the relationship between this and, and phenomenology, um, I'm going to give you a, a few scenes from uh, a, learning a particular uh, skill within this field, which is, is, is learning how to roll in the event of a capsize. So this is just one uh, part of that wider process of becoming a skilled kayaker, but, but quite an important one in terms of um, uh, safety and, and, and the types of um, environmental areas that are, are able to, it opens up access to if you're able to kind of uh, have this skill. Um, so a few of you in, your class, in the class may, may have some experience actually doing this. If you have some experience in uh, recreational kayaking, um, uh, rolling is basically when the kayak capsizes. If you have uh, the cockpit sealed with a spray skirt or um, uh, some sort of neoprene suit, you're, you're able to, to uh, return it to, um, uh, or kind of fix the situation. Um, in kayak hunting, there's a lot of different scenarios that, that um, recreational kayakers don't necessarily have to um, consider, which, which certainly affects the, the types of roles that um, hunters practice as, as well as um, uh, the way that they learn them too. Uh, some of these scenarios could include things like being tangled in the harpoon line or some of the other equipment. Um, you could be dragged or, or attacked by some of the injured animals. Um, they hunt walrus uh, and um, uh, uh, larger seals like bearded seals with, with these kayaks and some of them uh, can be quite aggressive uh, when, when they're, they're being hunted. Um, capsize could also uh, happen when you're holding uh, you know, vital equipment that's, that's really important to, to what's happening as well. And so there's all kinds of different scenarios and, and there's over 35 different um, uh, practice roles that um, hunters uh, uh, develop as a part of uh, learning to become a skilled hunter. Um, but one of the things I, I want to kind of show you, I'll, I'll show you a few examples of these, but, but what I want you to get a sense of is that what's being uh, kind of the goal in development here isn't just to be able to know which role to deploy in a specific situation. Um, rather, it's the ability to, to, to perceive and react with, with the contingencies of a situation at hand. So um, what they're really training for is, is a moment where there um, is kind of an unexpected complication that, that's going to make um, uh, rolling the, the kayak more difficult. So I'm going to break this into kind of three phases. Uh, the first is um, some rope exercises, which are, are kind of the entrance point to learning to roll. Um, and then I'll talk about some of the early attempts and some of the things happening there. And then uh, I'll move into the, the complex rolls. So the rope exercises are, are something that are, they're, they're kind of a, a practice in and of themselves that are often you know, kind of um, featured at, at things like um, aggregations and uh, festivals. Uh, they're uh, particularly designed to kind of develop a musculature and, and coordination that, that's necessary in, in rolling a kayak. 
And you, you can see how they work here. There's over 200 of these, these exercises, and, and basically you learn them in sequence, and then you kind of practice them in sequence until you're so exhausted you can't go any further. So, um, so they, they get progressively harder as, as, as you go along. Uh, but the general premise is that you, you rotate the body around an axis, and um, as they get more and more complicated, um, uh, they can involve a lot of strength, uh, but also control over how different um, muscle groups are being coordinated uh, in order to return to an upright position. Now these are some of the early examples of, of rolling. So these are images from um, beginners, basically kind of in their early attempts at, at getting some of the basic rolls. And if you've tried this before, you can probably emphasize with, uh, or empathize with, with, with what we're seeing here. Um, once you're capsized, um, there isn't really anything stable that you can push against. Um, and every kind of movement that you have seems to have a, a counterintuitive reaction that um, can, can make it very difficult uh, in order to roll. And so And what you can see here is that it's kind of a difficult thing to teach, right? Um, for one thing, once once you're actually upside down and, and the, the kind of the panic um, sinks in, you know, you're, you're stuck inside the kayak, you have uh, water rushing into your sinuses, um, you, you can't hear what, what somebody's telling you to do. These kind of give way to other basic roles, uh, so being able to roll with the, the, um, uh, the, the, the paddle in different awkward positions, um, uh, perhaps different scenarios where you might get capsized a little bit more unexpectedly. Um, you'll get the sense that some of the situations here are, are quite unlikely, like having to roll the, the kayak with a paddle behind your back, um, for example. Um, but what's being practiced here is, is the ability to, to roll in any circumstances, to, to be able to kind of, um, even under the most kind of difficult and constrained, awkward situations, uh, that you'd be able to kind of battle it through and find a way to, to bring the kayak um, uh, back up. And these get progressively harder. So in some of these complex roles here, uh, these are simulating uh, less than ideal sim uh, situations. So for example, if the hunter becomes separated from the, the paddle, um, or if they are holding important equipment in their hands, or there's other scenarios that are, are complicating their movement. The kind of core of um, important training roles are those 35 um, uh, main roles that are uh, practiced in the competitions. They're um, increasingly difficult, and, and very few people can actually do all of them. So even experienced hunters are constantly practicing these. Um, in order to kind of battle through and, and get them, sometimes you'll go back to the rope exercises to kind of simulate some of the different motions that, that are required. Um, uh, but they can take a lot of focus development and, and training in order to be able to, to get the hang of them. So a couple of, of key points and observations um, that, that, that can uh, fuel some discussion on the relationship between this and phenomenology. Um, you know, first of all, we tend to think about skills, um, particularly in university life, but also in kind of wider um, Western discourses around knowledge. We, we tend to think about skills as, as schemas for action or, or sort of recipes for action uh, that we deploy in the world. So, so you learn them and then deploy them uh, under the right circumstances, sort of like cognitive algorithms that um, uh, 
uh, we, we basically internalize. Uh, what we're looking at here, I think, in the learning of a skill like rolling is something very different. Um, what's be, being assembled here is, is the capacity to get, engage creatively with the flow of, of environmental impermanence. So you're in this kind of dynamic situation that has um, all kinds of unknown variables, and, and what's being developed is, is the capacity to, to um, kind of creatively change some of those different relationships between the body and, and the world in order to kind of uh, bring the kayak uh, back into an upright position. Now, the learning of this knowledge between generations is quite interesting. Um, it, it is uh, probably better to describe this as a process of, of co-construction where um, uh, no amount of, of, of uh, verbal instruction can really install this in a learner. Um, rather, it has to be sort of um, built both between um, the, the learner and, and the teacher as well. Um, and it matches something that was described by William Gibson, a sort of um, cognitive psychologist and sort of, I think he, his work intersected with anthropology a fair bit, uh, much like Merleau-Ponty uh, uh, did. But um, he describes this sort of uh, learning as, as an education of attention. Um, so the um, teacher can sort of direct uh, the learner's um, awareness of, of different parts of, of their practice, um, uh, but they can't actually uh, basically tell them how to do it. So um, it's kind of a strange relationship between the learner and teacher in terms of, of how we tend to think about knowledge in, in university systems in particular. Um, so it's not a matter of uh, transmission or, or passive acquisition. These are, are not kind of, um, uh, kind of good words for describing uh, how this um, uh, skill persists between generations. And that's a really interesting observation in particular for um, archaeology because a lot of interpretation uh, rests on, on, on the transmission of different um, uh, materials and artifact types and skills. And um, a lot of the narratives that we, we um, construct around past processes, really when you, when you look at them very closely, they're glued together through this um, a notion of, of passive transmission sometimes. Um, it's something that also figures very prominently in, in things like evolutionary archaeology or, or kind of uh, the blanket application of, of Darwinian principles to, um, uh, to, to technologies and artifacts and um, uh, uh, environmental adaptations too. Um, but as, as well, in order to kind of build this knowledge, um, it, it's not separate from the environment itself. So it's not abstract, it's, it's not representational knowledge. It, it has to be built um, when you're immersed in that environment um, and you have to kind of use those technologies and tools in order to, to be able to, to develop the, the requisite abilities. Now, th this sort of uh, production of the skill is, is really important in terms of how it structures the community as well. And so um, one kind of useful way of lens at looking at, through, through, looking at this through is, is, is through a concept introduced by Levin Wenger, which draws very heavily on, on Merleau-Ponte, which, uh, which they call a community of practice. So uh, this is a community that's not formed just by subscription to a kind of a pool of external ideas. It's a community that's generated through the physicality of practice. Um, and so uh, this kind of underlying notion that there's Inuit forms of knowledge and that this applies very much in terms of the, the sense of community and, and the way that people relate to each other um, is, is something that, that certainly can be observed here. There is this um, shared subjectivity or rapport that, that, that develops between um, individuals who participate in the skill. And the specific form of subjectivity that, that we could refer to is, is something that Merleau-Ponty would um, calls intercorporeality. So it's it's a sort of intersubjectivity that that's um, kind of built through bodily action and and the physicality of practice. And so the, the image on the right here is sort of a clumsy representation of of kind of thinking about the the kayaking community as a community of practice. Um, Levin Wenger used this term peripheral participation. Um, so all participants in, in a community of practice uh, are, are peripheral participants in some way in that there's really no uh, kind of center ideal um, of, of a particular skill or practice. Um, uh, uh, so, but as you kind of uh, move through different um, uh, stages and, and, and progress through um, uh, processes of participation and, and develop skill, you're kind of drawn further and further into the subjectivity of the community. Um, that said, there's all kinds of varying forms of participation, right? Um, there's people who participate in kayaking without even uh, actually kayaking. Uh, they um, support the community in different ways. They're involved in the production of some of the different materials, the skin clothing, the, um, uh, the kayak frames. Uh, they um, uh, 
uh, there, there's really quite a variety of, of ways that, that they're a part of the community. And there is sort of a level of intersubjectivity that pervades all levels of practice. So just sort of a couple of, of final observations about, um, you know, how a kayaking can uh, kind of intersect, uh, not just with phenomenology, but some of the other fields that sort of draw inspiration from that. So uh, some of the different um, theorists are, are mentioned here in texts that, that you, you certainly will run into uh, when you read kind of contemporary anthropology. So some of the key authors that are uh, uh, that, that show up in a variety of different texts, and, and perhaps you'll have a chance to, to read some of them uh, later in the class. I, I'm not, not sure what Dr. Perich has, has planned yet, but um, uh, the you know the first one is you know there's this term uh, relational knowledge that that shows up a lot um, in in contemporary discussions of things like ontology. Um, you can certainly think of uh, Inuit knowledge here in this in this context as relational, in that it involves an interdependence of materials, social relationships, and, and a dynamic environment. And critically, it's sort of brought into being through uh, movement. Um, so movement is a very key part of um, of how knowledge is generated between generations. Um, so uh, the community's persistence through time is 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 not just sort of a um, a static process, but but uh, rather a dynamic and creative one. Uh, the other concerns the materials themselves, and I think this is a particularly important um, uh, observation for archaeologists. Um, uh, you know, in in this particular context of the kayaks, you can see that that those um, you know tools and and the kayaks themselves um, afford certain types of movement and experience, um, and and in this way they sort of act as a scaffolding for building different types of awareness, intention, and, and experience that um, that the kayaking community in Greenland uh, considers to be a very important part of of Inuit subjectivity and Inuit perceptions of the world and and ways that the community apprehends meaning in in their environment. Um, so there's a fair bit of discussion um, in, in recent years about um, uh, things like material agency and um, uh, uh, cyborgs and things like that. And when you encounter some of that literature, um, sometimes it can be a bit um, strange in the way that it's brought up. But when you think back to some of these um, examples like kayaking, it can be a way of thinking through uh, what, what those different uh, perspectives are um, introducing. And the final point is about uh, kayaks and the durability of dispositions. So uh, we all have disp dispositions. We all have sort of an impulse to the world and um, our, our kind of first reaction to things does uh, very much structure the, uh, the way that we, that we uh, think and act together. Um, now, the, the kayakers involved in, in modern kayaking who participate in these competitions, who work towards uh, developing the skills associated with hunting and, and uh, work towards becoming skilled hunters themselves, um, they, they also, it's not the basis of their livelihood anymore. So it's, it's a very different situation than um, in the past. And so some of the politics around it are, are quite different in the present. Um, people who participate in, in modern kayaking, they're, they're doctors or politicians, baggage handlers, carpenters. I'm just kind of looking at some of the people in this image. They're, they're uh, students and um, uh, also full-time hunters, too, uh, or fishermen who are um, uh, participating in this. Um, and, and one of the kind of um, ideas with, within this is that the experiences that, that are generated by kind of um, uh, this new position of, of kayaking in, in contemporary Greenland are very important in, in how uh, they act out uh, or uh, in how they act in those, those roles. So, so the um, embodied knowledge that, that's generated in kayaking transposes in each of these and, and structures how uh, they participate in those fields as, as, as Greenlanders. So um, there's this idea that um, it's, it's carrying forward intergenerational experience um, in a way that, that helps to craft a, a very um, kind of Inuit developed um, sense of, of modernity in Greenland. So, so those dispositions, those, those understandings of uh, animal behavior and uh, the relationship between community members that are, that are, are generated through the physicality of practice um, are durable in other parts of life. So, so they, they structure how the community thinks and acts together in, in other contexts and fields beyond uh, kayaking itself. So the last thing I want to talk a little bit about is, is the um, kind of how a film um, uh, played a role in the research itself. Um, Ingold kind of gets at this in, in the beginning of his, his discussion where he talks about anthropology as uh, sort of um, uh, 
a field that in, in many ways is, is founded on, on the notion of uh, the ability to be you know, uh, in a position where the anthropologist is a viewer of views, where you can have these multiple worldviews of, of the same uh, scenarios and, and the, the anthropologist can step back and look at them. Um, and he, he does quite a good job, I think, of, of showing how that, you know, may sort of oppose certain trajectories in, in Western thought. It also exemplifies others, and particularly um, uh, Cartesian dualism when he's uh, speaking about um, things like Levi-Strauss's structuralism. Um, one of the things that kind of supports this in many ways is, is the process of, uh, of kind of uh, lots of anthropological research where you go to a community, you, you do participant observation, you work, you know, you, you, you think about um, the, the, the sample that you're producing of knowledge and then you represent it primarily through text and that, that writing up phase tends to take place um, uh, once you move back out of the field and into the campus in general. It doesn't always work out that way, but um, that sort of physical separation of the field and the campus, I think, um, uh, works to support that, that idea that, that Ingold is, is attacking in anthropology, that, um, that we really can step back and, and see um, these, these separate views as though they're arbitrary from, from reality itself. Now, because the um, uh, project focused very much on um, uh, these forms of embodied knowledge that are generated through the physicality of the skill, uh, one of the goals in the project um, uh, that I had kind of as, uh, in, in the doctoral studies anyways, and it, it's still something that, that I'm very much working on and, and in prog uh, you know, kind of developing, is, is kind of how to generate new ways of um, uh, co-producing knowledge with, with the community as, as a way of, of um, developing outcomes from research that, that don't just kind of get trapped in that um, uh, older uh, style of um, you know, representing communities through text. Um, and I think that there's a, a couple of unique opportunities in uh, some of uh, the, the new media options that, that we have today. So um, uh, in the uh, in, in the project, um, working with community members, we did a lot of filming of different episodes of learning, uh, different episodes of uh, practice around things like uh, construction of kayaks um, uh, as, as sort of a separate part to, to these interviews. Um, and the idea uh, was sort of raised very early on to sort of try and co-produce a documentary film. Um, now, in the end, this ended up being quite, quite a long process that had um, kind of um, different results than is expected. Um, you can imagine, I mean, it involved doing lots of uh, filming work with, with um, uh, community members over a three-year period and then returning and sort of opening the editing process and um, uh, kind of working with individuals one-on-one -on -one to think about how some of the clips are assembled, how they're... Um, you know, pieces of their interviews interact with what other people are saying and um, uh, what sort of uh, videos of different episodes of practice they can be linked with. Um, and the original idea to produce a single documentary film kind of uh, dispersed over time and it took on different forms. So uh, there were a variety of different outcomes. There was a short film that was involved in museum exhibits, um, a series of smaller um, uh, vignettes that went into um, uh, uh, community schools um, for, for a different uh, mo uh, a specific module they were learning. Uh, there was a, a website with um, elder interviews and a variety of other um, uh, media uh, preserved there. Uh, but as, as kind of a process of, of working, it was an interesting way of developing uh, kind of new forms of co-authorship that I think are a little bit more difficult to do through that traditional ethnographic process where um, uh, you're predominantly representing um, the outcome through text. And so um, it did open opportunities, I think, for, for hunters to kind of apply some of that kind of embodied sensibility that, that's built through, built through um, uh, this sort of environmental engagement in, in terms of, of building some of these these outcomes as well, and and I would say that that you know it was it was far from a complete process in the end, but um, it, it's one that that I, I still kind of take up in, in the projects that that I'm running now, and um, and and I'm still kind of working to develop and and build into um, kind of new ways of um, of, of developing co-authorship with communities. Um, so anyways, that's all for now, and, and I hope that there's some material in there that, that can uh, provide some interesting discussion, and, um, and I hope that um, you know, at some point there will be a chance to, to meet with, with each of you or, or have discussions about um, uh, some of the things that you're learning in theory. Anyways, uh, bye for now.